in the following video, we're going to examine the four different types of parent functions we'll be using in this lesson. The parent functions help us identify our transformations, which are translations, reflections, and dilations as well. So let's first start with our constant function. Now, a constant function, the general equation for the parent function is f of x equals a, which remember means y equals a where a is any number. And we've learned before in previous lessons that y equals a is a horizontal line. And so if I look over on my graph, I see y equals 1. So it's a horizontal line through 1. And to practice with our domain range, since the horizontal line extends to the left and the right forever, all x values are included in it. So our domain is all real numbers. The range, which is based off your y values, we see for this line, it only exists at y equals 1 for this one. You know, if y equals 3, it would only exist on this line. If y equals 5, it would only exist on this line. So your range is only going to consist of one number, and that would be the y value which creates the horizontal line. And so if I look at this graph here, you know, my domain is all real numbers. My range would be y equals, it only exists on one. So my range is y equals one. So that's a constant function. Now, if we were to look at the linear functions, the identity function for linear would be y equals x, f of x equals x, y equals x, and it passes through all the points with the coordinates a, a. What that means is all the points where x and y are equal to each other. You can see here I have the point, you know, 1, 1. x is 1, y is 1. I have the point 2, 2, 3, 3. I have the point negative 1, negative 1, negative 2, negative 2. So this is the parent function for most linear functions that we're going to be working with. The domain and range for this the arrows go up and to the right forever, down and to the left forever. So since it goes to the right forever and to the left forever, the domain is all real numbers. Since it goes up and down forever, your range is all real numbers. And so my domain and range are both all real numbers, which means you're dealing with a linear, if you're dealing with a linear function, your domain and range are always going to be all real numbers because the arrows in the end extend on forever. So y equals x is going to be the parent function that we'll be using for most of our linear functions. Let's next look at absolute value functions. Now, an absolute value function, the graph of an absolute value is v in shape. The parent function of absolute values is f of x equals the absolute value of x, y equals the absolute value of x, the domain, again, the arrows go up and to the right, up and to the left forever. So since it's going right and left forever, your domain is all real numbers. The range is a little bit more difficult. The range, you're going to have to look at what the lowest point here is on the graph. And so if I take a look, yeah, my range, my y values go up forever. But as I come down, I see the lowest point that exists on this graph is right here. We call that lowest point on the graph the vertex. And so the range, this statement says the range is the set of real numbers greater than or equal to zero. A way to remember the range is you look at the y value of the vertex. The y value because you're looking at the range and the vertex because the vertex is the lowest point on the graph here. And so if I want this example, I see my vertex is at the origin 0, 0. So my range, the y values, they start at 0. And then they go up forever. So they start at 0, so they're equal to 0. And they increase, so that means they're greater than or equal to 0. So we're dealing with our translations, our reflections, our dilations of absolute value functions. We're going to use y equals absolute value of x as our parent function. 
it helps to understand how to find the domain will always be real numbers in the range we have to identify our vertex and determine its location on the y-axis and which direction our arrows go to determine the symbol. It's very similar to how we're going to deal with quadratic functions with transformations. So I have here the quadratic function f of x equals x squared is our parent function, y equals x squared is our parent function. The domain, again, all real numbers. And if we look at this, it's very similar. Instead of V-shaped quadratic parabolas are U-shaped, but it's very similar that there is the lowest point on the graph, just like we had for our absolute value function. And so the range is very similar as well. And so for the range, it's the same idea. The range is based off the Y value of the vertex. And so if I look at this one, here's my vertex. It's located at the origin. So my range starts at zero on the Y and goes up forever. So it starts at zero, so it's equal to zero. And it goes up forever, so that means it's greater than or equal to zero. So these are our parent functions. Every single function we're going to look at, we can actually come back to this and look at what transformation occurs from this graph to the ones we're going to be examining. So in order to do that, we have to look at our transformations themselves on how we can actually move and manipulate these parent functions just by adding, subtracting, or multiplying by certain values. So the transformations we'll be working with are translations, reflections, and dilations. I want you to add this on to your notes. The general form that we're going to be working with when it comes to, let's say, we'll start with absolute value, is y equals a times the absolute value of x minus h plus k, where x minus h are in the absolute value. For quadratics, we're going to do y equals a times the quantity x minus h squared plus k. And these are going to be the forms we're going to use to help identify our transformations. Each letter here, a h k a h k all have a particular role in translations reflections or dilations and we're going to examine those so when we start dealing with identifying transformations i want to make sure we can identify what the value of a is what the value of h is what the value of k is and that's where this comes in we see here that we have x plus h x minus h i can kind of break these down into two areas, f of x plus k, f of x minus k. So I'm going to break this translation into two parts. The top half, we see h deals with left and right movement. And so we use the letter h for our horizontal translation. The part that's a little bit tricky for some people to understand and you can kind of relate to how we created absolute value equations is when it says x plus h, you're actually moving to the left h units. When it says x minus h, you're actually moving to the right h units. And so that's what is going to be hard for us is it's kind of like the opposite of what your mind tells you. We're going to examine that. And the reason why it's the opposite is if you look at the formula, either one, you see in the formula it says x minus h. So if you're subtracting a positive, you know, it's still going to stay x minus. So since h is positive, you go to the right. If you're subtracting a negative, minus a negative makes it a plus sign. And so since h is negative, you go to the left. So since, the, since the formula for transformations 
the general setup has a minus sign attached to the x and attached to the h, then it's going to be the opposite of what you think. However, if when it comes to your k values, your k values, it says f of x plus k. So if you're adding a number outside of the parentheses, you're going to go k units up. f of x minus k, if you're subtracting, you're going to go k units down. And so k then represents our vertical movement. And here's how I tell students to remember h for horizontal, h horizontal starts with h. K for vertical, I tell them mathematicians cannot spell, so we accidentally spell vertical with a K. When in actuality, you spell vertical with a C. I don't want you guys to think that I can't spell. So we have vertical. So if K is positive, you go up. If K is negative, you go down. If H is negative, you go left. If H is positive, you go right. And we're going to examine what that means. So that is our translations. The next part is our reflections. There are two types of reflections that can occur. We can either reflect over the x-axis or reflect over the y-axis. Negative f of x. So if you're taking the negative of your expression, then it's going to reflect over the x-axis. So a negative on the outside, if we see this, this negative is on the outside here, that means you reflect over the x-axis. And that's where our A value comes in. If your A value is negative, that's when you reflect over the x-axis. If we look at the other form, it says F of negative x. So if you're taking the negative of the actual variable itself, then that's when you reflect over the y-axis. And the next parts we're looking at, we see there are two different types of stretching, compressing, or expandings that are going on. These are called dilations. So I'm again going to split this in half so we can look at them separately. So again, we see a times f of x, a times f of x. So this a represents the a I'm just talking about here. We know if that A is negative, it reflects. The size of A determines our dilation. The sine of A determines the reflection. So the sine of A determines the reflection. The size of A determines the dilation. And so if A is greater than 1, if the size of A is greater than 1, then what that does is it stretches your graph vertically. Because if you think about it, if you're multiplying by a larger number, the graph is going to increase faster. So it's like you're stretching it vertically up. You're making it the rate change faster and faster and faster every time. If A is smaller, you know, a number between 0 and 1, it's going to compress the graph vertically. If we have a coefficient attached to the x on the inside, it's going to be the same idea. It's going to compress horizontally. But if you think about compressed horizontally, you're smashing it together. So it's going to stretch in a way, kind of be very similar to stretching vertically. If you're expanding horizontally, then you're kind of smashing it down, and it's going to compress vertically. So these, so these two are very similar to each other, and these two are very similar to each other. We're going to focus primarily on this top part is if your coefficient is large, if the size is large, then it's going to stretch vertically. If the size is small, it's going to compress vertically. So overall, there are a lot of concepts you have to remember here, but I think if you can remember this general form for absolute value and quadratics, it makes sense. If you identify A, H, and K in each problem, you'll look at, is there a reflection? based off this sine of A? Is there a dilation based off the size of A? What type of horizontal change is going to occur based off of your H value? And what type of vertical translation will occur based off your K value? So make sure you have this written down on your notes as well. And we're going to use these concepts in the next part of this lesson.